few comments on these uh, papers. Uh, as um, you might have expected, uh, Sheldon Pollock uh, invests a lot in belittling Hindu civilization, you know, for example, by belittling the role of Sanskrit, but also in other ways. Uh, one of the uh, ways you've seen here is the um, claim, it was on the slides, uh, the first speaker that is, uh, though I didn't hear him say it, but it was on the slides, namely that the Ramayana is really based on Homer's Ilias and Odyssey. Now, this is a fairly common claim. You see on, on the Eurasian research list of Steve Farmer and Michael Witzel, you come across this quite a bit. Um, now, it so happens that here, uh, Pollock represents a fairly extreme school and that other Indologists disagree. Um, and, uh, you know, I cannot go through this whole discussion, but one uh, contribution which you will really care to know is by Nick Allen, a British uh, student of comparative mythology. And um, he shows that very many themes in, the, in Homer, on the one hand, and in, in that paper he studies the Mahabharata, are indeed very similar. Yeah, as for the Ramayana, they always say, for example, that Homer starts his story with the abduction of a wife, namely Helen, uh, becomes Helen of Troy, and so Sita is the same thing. Well, not exactly the same thing, but okay, we can admit that there is a common motive here. Now, with the Mahabharata, there is a lot more. And so he shows about 25 motives that are common to the story of Ulysses and to the story of Arjuna. Um, what he shows moreover is that there is reason to think that the uh, Mahabharata themes represent an earlier version. And among them, and this then is a bit in the line of what the second speaker said, um, is the amount of sacredness. There is a spiritual dimension to these motives in the Mahabharata, which is missing in uh, Homer. And the reason for that, the probable reason for that, is that, you see, India was the cradle land where you had um, a tradition in its full flowering, and after an emigration, you see only the bare bones of that story uh, were retained, and the deeper meaning was lost. Because the alternative possibility, you see, he, he just juxtaposes the two possibilities, he doesn't decide between them. But it's obvious that they're not equal, because the alternative is that, you see, it was the same story, and then in India, maybe under the influence of the, the Harappans or so, um, uh, a, a dimension was added. You see, this is a bit bizarre. Wouldn't they then have taken over, rather, the stories uh, internal to India that, that carry these meanings. But so at any rate, you see a lot is happening in Indology and it's not all dark. Um, then you see another thing that doesn't require anything Vedic or Puranic or, or you know, out of this world uh, that can be verified is the story of uh, the Hindus being responsible for the death of Sanskrit and the Muslims trying to revive it. Now, I mean, I should study this more closely, but obviously I am very surprised to hear this. But on the other hand, I'm not so surprised because you see the animus against Hindus is so great in, in important circles that they really come up with very wild theories. Like for instance, uh, I was at the um, annual gathering of the American Academy of Religion and there was a session about caste, of course. There were probably several, but okay, there was one session about caste. And there was one PhD student, a Dalit from um, uh, Andhra Pradesh. And, uh, you know, she was a shy girl and so on. You, you, could, you could not but sympathize with her. But then you see, the paper she gave was so funny. 
So she, she, she talked about how ever since Vedic times, Hinduism has always been hostile to the Dalits, and the proof was this. In the Purusha Sukta, the Brahmins are mentioned, the Rajanyas are mentioned, the Vaishyas, the Shudras, but not the Panchamas, not the Dalits. And this proves, this proves that they had such contempt for the Dalits that they didn't even deem them worthy of being mentioned. You know, it's like uh, it's like in the joke that uh, you know in um, in India they discovered a copper wire, you know, ten meters below the ground, and they said, "Ah, this proves that the Harappans already had a radio." <laughs> and then in Pakistan they dig equally deep, and they don't find anything, and they say, "Ah, this proves that they already had the wireless." <laughs> you know. Um, and so this is taken seriously. You see, this is patronized. This is PhD is given for that. So, you know, this anti-Hinduism gives some very weird results, but, you know, other people just are more level-headed. Like the story about the Sanskrit cosmopolis, uh, you know, he wrote a, a special book about it, but at first he had uh, given a paper on it, which is included in a book by Jan Hauben. Um, I met him a week ago, and um, he tried to defend Pollock. I mean, I discussed this Pollock thing with him. And so um, this paper about uh, National Socialism that we talked about yesterday, you know, he defended it saying, ah, but it's already old, it's already 23 years old, you know, don't worry about it. And Hindus make too much of it and so on. So I asked him, well, if it's, if it's that old, you see, I agree that an evolution in your personal thought is possible, but then why has he never expressed that? He has all the forms at his disposal. Um, so, you know, you have these in-between people who don't want to rock the boat, who want to stay friends with everyone, but who are not as extreme as Pollock is. Now, talking about extreme, uh, that last paper I did find a bit extreme. You see, it starts well, but then to, uh, to take the uh, Puranic chronology as history, you know, that's like a, a burglary from mythology into history. You know, if you say Mahabharata war 5,000 years ago, uh, that's not unreasonable, though not certain either. Well, you see, that is testable. You know, you can try to verify it. And so far, uh, I wouldn't agree. Uh, because in the case of the Mahabharata, you know, the core of the story is um, a chariot battle. You know, Krishna is the charioteer. And so, you know, if a story is being retold generations after one another, more recent elements creep in. So you could say, well, maybe, you see, chariots were not there yet in the original battle, and they were added later. But that is very unlikely, because it's really the core of the story. Now, chariot warfare can be dated. You see, the battle between the Egyptians and the Hittites is about 12, 1300 BC. It's a chariot battle. Uh, the pursuit of the Israelites uh, fleeing Egypt, maybe not historical, but at any rate, it's also about 1200, 1300 BC. The original war of Troy, about which uh, Homer wrote his epic 500 years later, was again in the 13th century BC. And so you have a window in history of this chariot warfare because before that, the technology wasn't good enough, especially the metallurgy, you had to like, fortify wheels and so on. And um, uh, from about 500 BC, it is outdated because you know, then uh, cavalry uh, becomes the norm. And, and chariot warfare is only used for entertainment in the arena in Rome, uh, but so it's no longer militarily useful. And so the Mahabharata war cannot be too far off these moments. And so, in 3100 BC, well, you see, the technology is just not good enough. There are also no signs. This may partly be made uh, understandable because, you see, wood, of course, decays in the Indian climate and disappears. So you won't find any chariots of those days. But still, um, so that is unlikely. Also, when you take uh, a number of Indian data, 
you come to the same chronology of about 1400 BC. Namely, you have this uh, Puranic datum that uh, there is, I think, 1050 years between the coronation of Mahapadmananda and I think the coronation of Parikshit, the grandson of Arjuna. And so, you know, it can't be too far off. You see, that would again lead to the 15th, 15th century BC. So I don't believe this uh, 3000 and so on. Uh, the concept of four yugas, that is very old. You see, uh, it's not mentioned in the Rig Veda as far as I know, but it was certainly already there. And in fact, it was there much earlier because you find the same system in Germanic mythology, in Greek mythology, you know, the Golden Age, the Silver Age, and so on. But very far away among the Mayas, you find it. And so, you know, it's probably a very ancient concept. And then in India, it was, uh, there were figures uh, tagged onto it. And these probably have to do with the discovery of the precession. So you had a, a cycle in which the zodiac passes uh, the spring equinox in a cycle of about 25,800 years. And so probably this is the basis of the uh, yuga cycle. And so it's not that dramatic, you know, it's each, each period is just a few thousand years. But then you see, with their religious urge, you know, they project the goals ever higher, you know, and so these, these cycles are also multiplied, you see, 25,000 years, you know, concerned days of men, but what is men is days of the gods, so it is times 360 or times 1,000. And then you get these unwieldy large numbers, which imply, for instance, the drama lived a million years ago. Now, I have some experience with these chronological discussions. Um, back in the time of the Ayodhya affair, you see, I argued forcefully that, of course, there had been a temple there. And I mean, by now it is vindicated in all respects, uh, archaeologically, first of all. Um, and so, you know, many people of these, uh, you know, history rewriters, uh, you know, there's this RSS organization in Mumbai that busies itself with rewriting history. Now, I don't see any rewriting history being that all that they do is just to rake up the Puranic figures and keep on repeating and repeating and repeating them. And so in my case, you they said, ah, yeah, you're on the side of the temple. Ah, that means that you have proven that Rama Setu and that you have proven that Rama lived uh, one million years ago and so on. Well, no, I have not proven that. And you know, that is also not a very logical link to say that if you've proven one thing, then it means you have proven all these others because they're not logically linked. You can have the Ramayana story without these wild chronological claims. So there I think that um, Indology has done some useful work, but you know, that does not go diametrically against Hindu tradition. You see in some cases, like for instance, the dating of the Mahabharata to the 15th century BC, it coincides, it perfectly uh, harmonizes with elements in Hindu tradition. And so um, the problem there is, you see, what is traditional? Many people think that they are being traditional when they say that um, the Rig Veda, let's go back to the Purusha Sukta, it mentions the four functions in society. Ah, yeah, they already had the caste system. You know, you, you have to, you know, you're a Brahmin, you have to marry a Brahmin girl because the Purusha Sukta said this and that. No, the Purusha Sukta doesn't say that at all. It doesn't say anything about how members of castes are recruited. It doesn't say anything about endogamy. And so, you know, there is this tendency among traditionalists to project their tradition back into the past. And so everything that, you know, was Hindu, let's say in 1800 or, or in the 20th century even, that this is from time immemorial. Well, sometimes it is. Like, for instance, in Harappa, you find traces of, you know, married women wearing this uh, sindur in the parting of the hair. For instance, that, that tradition is that old. But other traditions are not, and yet, because of the traditionalist spirit, they are back projected. So there, I think it is uh, inevitable uh, that you know some elements of this um, 
rather skeptical, rather sober uh, in the Lodgy uh, approach have to be taken over? Now, one question, because of course, uh, so, uh, I think, uh, from my understanding of Mikhail Gani's work, yes. regarding the dating of the Dagar River, which is mm -hmm. uh, the Saraswati Reservoir, and correlating with birth of Mahabharata, I think he would probably agree closer with the Sankar Pi two thousand and three process than putting it at Sankar Pi. Well, I, the two thousand yeah. river has dried up, just completely. Exactly, and I already remember Sitaram well, a great devotee of the Mahabharata story, uh, explained to me that uh, one reason why it has to be about 1500 BC is precisely that the Mahabharata does not mention uh, the Saraswati River. One of these people um, uh, goes on a journey and is described which rivers he crosses when he's coming back, and the Saraswati is not mentioned. Secondly, also in the Mahabharata, the battle is missed by uh, the Balarama because he goes on a pilgrimage. And where does he go on a pilgrimage? To the place where the Saraswati River ends. Because then already, you see, there was still a rivulet, the Saraswati in Haryana, which in the Rajasthan desert stops. Okay? And, and so that was already the case. So that, that's another argument against 3000 BC. That must be, No, I think it is definitely after 2000. There's another reason, a totally different reason, but since we're busy, okay, I'll say it anyway. Um, there, is, uh, there are descriptions of uh, stellar configurations. Like Bhima is lying on his deathbed, on this bed of arrows, and he has this boon that he, he can choose his moment of dying. And so meanwhile, all kinds of things happen, and the position of the stars is described. Now, as you said that, um, the um, star um, Magha, which is Regulus, um, is with the full moon, and this happens after, it's explicitly said, after the solstice. Now, uh, in this great precession cycle, uh, Regulus has crossed the solstice axis in about 2300 BC. So, this is a very clear thing where you can decide. You see, uh, in 3100 BC, it was about 10 degrees before the solstice, and in 1500 BC, it's about 8 degrees after the solstice. Now, the text says that it's after the solstice, so this is as clear as you can get. So, here I am really convinced to see this uh, 3000 and so on is not. Uh, moreover, you, could, you, you have to see, and again, this is in full respect of the tradition, that the Mahabharata happens in a context, you see, it happens at a certain moment in history. Like Vyasa, who is the uh, grandfather of the protagonists, you know, is credited with uh, closing the Vedic uh, era, you know, definitively giving each place to all the hymns and so on. And so you see that it's part of Vedic history. Then you can see that in the um, Rig Veda, you have, it, you know, it's a very old book, it's much older than the Mahabharata war, except for the 10th book which is added later. And there you find, I think, Shantanu, the great-grandfather of the protagonists. And in the Yajur Veda, you find, I think, the name Vichitravirya, who is not a biological, but the social grandfather of the protagonists. Um, so you clearly see, you know, that this is part of history, and this history is coherent. And like, for example, I, I just read on uh, the Indo-Eurasian research list, that Steve Farmer, you know, who always lambasts everything about Hindu tradition, um, also makes fun of these uh, of these datings, um, and particularly of the Puranic king lists. But you see, a sober historian, and you know, there is nothing Western or Indian or so about it. A sober historian doesn't reason like this. You see, of course, you know, like the biblical king lists, for instance. Yeah, they, they are probably not, not, they don't live up to modern standards of history. But to throw them all out as merely fantasy, that also doesn't work. You know, like for instance, the War of Troy. You see, in the 19th century, you had this rationalism, this Wissenschaft that we yesterday talked about. And so, um, people at that time were very skeptical about the historicity of the Trojan War. 
But then Heinrich Schliemann went to Troy, started digging, and found the city. So it was not so crazy. Now, of course, in Homer, there happens you know, some funny things, predictions of the future and so on. You know, uh, but you know, th that's poetic fantasy that is added to a historical core. And so the same thing must have happened in India, like the Puranic king lists. You know, they have, for instance, this typically historic, historical trait that the different versions in the different Puranas are roughly the same, but not exactly. If they had been exactly the same, you could say, oh, they have been copied from one another. Or, or maybe there was a big conspiracy. You know, all the Purana writers across regions and centuries, they all got together and said, you know, just to fool the Indologists 2,000 years from now, we're going to coordinate our story. No, you see, there, there are human mistakes and, and so on, variations, but essentially it's the same thing. And you see these things also fit in what occasional kings happen to be mentioned in the Rig Veda, in the Mahabharata and so on. So, you know, in that respect, the Hindu tradition is fairly good. You know, it is said that uh, Hindus have a lack of history. Even Sri Kantavagiri himself, an Indian historian, says that very forcefully. But nevertheless, all the elements are there, you know, to, to build history on it. And with that, I'm sure that uh, you will be happy that I wind up. <laughs>